Welcome to St. Louis on the Air. I'm Sarah Fenske. Today we're discussing St. Louis County's effort to decrease the size of its jail population. The jail population in St. Louis County dropped significantly in the last year, going from about 1,200 inmates in July 2018 to 960 this May. That's a 22% decrease. This change is due to a comprehensive effort that's been in the works since the unrest in Ferguson five years ago and $4.5 million in grants from the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation. Its Safety and Justice Challenge has dedicated $148 million to tackling what it calls the front door of mass incarceration, local jail systems. Joining us to talk about these changes is Beth Hubner, a professor of criminology and criminal justice at the University of Missouri-St. Louis. She serves as the lead researcher in the ongoing effort working with St. Louis County, the St. Louis County Circuit Court, and other agencies. Beth, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Can you tell us a little bit about how you first got involved with this effort? Absolutely. Uh, in 2015, the MacArthur Foundation put out a request for proposals and put out a lot of information about their jail efforts. Um, and a group of St. Louis stakeholders from all over, um, from the courts, police, the jail, um, wanted to put a proposal together. And I have done a lot of work in this area and, and know many of the partners in St. Louis. So they asked me to help put the grant together. And so I have been kind of the convener of the grant since then, um, getting people together. And we wrote the first grant. We were successful. And then we've con continued on as a team since then. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about this population that mm -hmm. you're dealing with and, and trying to reduce. A lot of people think that jail is the same thing as prison, and mm -hmm. that's absolutely not the case. Tell us a little bit about who ends up locked up in county jail. Uh, the jail has populations from all over the city and the state. Um, and I think the biggest thing that's important to understand when you think about jail is about 70 to 80 percent of people in jail have not been convicted. So they are pretrial and they can be there for pretrial offenses ranging from something as serious as a murder to something as um, small as a municipal traffic offense. So the jail includes um, a wide um, number of people from around the community. Okay. It's a very diverse group. So how do you even begin to tackle that? Mm -hmm. Well, since I'm a researcher, I always begin to tackle things with data. Um, and so that was our first effort as far as the, as far as the safety and justice in challenge was to look at who's in the jail, what have they done, and how long have they been there? Um, and that's where we, we began our efforts. And the largest group, you're saying, these are the people who are waiting their day in court. Mm -hmm. We don't know whether or not they're guilty of anything yet. Absolutely. Uh, but we have to do something with mm -hmm. them. We can't just have them walking the streets and fleeing. So sure. how, do you, how do you deal with that population? Um, yeah, the pretrial population is where we put a lot of our efforts. Um, as you mentioned, um, we have to make sure that the community is safe and that people don't flee. At the same time, we know that even three days in jail um, pre-trial, because these people have not been convicted, um, can have a detrimental effect on your family relationships, on your job. So the goal has been to understand um, who is at greatest risk to the community, um, who can be supervised in the community safely, and, and what's the best way to do that. So that's where we put a lot of our efforts. And so they might end up doing things like in-home monitoring instead mm -hmm. of being stuck in jail. Yeah, electronic monitoring. You know, even some simple common sense uh, tools like text reminders like you have for your dentist. Many people forget their dentist appointment. Many people forget court. So very cost-effective, simple things like that. Um, coupled with a bus pass can help people get to court. People want to get to court if you remove some of those barriers. So these people were previously being held in jail because people were worried they wouldn't show up. What mm -hmm. you're finding is most of them do show up? Most people want to show up to court. Not everyone, um, but most people do. And so, um, you know, like I said, text reminders, providing services for people um, and being flexible with schedules does help people get to court. So tell me about then these, these probation violators, mm -hmm. who I understand are another big chunk of people right. who Absolutely. are in jail. These are people who have been um, let out and they have in some way messed up. Mm -hmm. Shouldn't those people, shouldn't we just throw away the key? <laughs> <laughs> right. So uh, the second population we were looking at, yes, is people who violated their probation, but it's for a technical violation. So this is not a new crime. Oftentimes um, people are worried. Uh, maybe they run. They don't check in with their probation officer like they should. Uh, maybe they haven't kept it job or kept up with some of those um, requirements of probation. And so these individuals have been deemed safe to be in the community. 
but perhaps need some extra services. And these individuals before our program were spending 100 days in jail um, waiting to be released. Just for one of these technical violations. For one of the technical viola- violations. So that has been our effort is to streamline that process. And if they are deemed safe and there's a screening process that's very involved, um, then they're released back into the community with services so they can make sure to stay on track. So how do you streamline that process? Is mm-hmm. it a matter of getting the right people in the room or is it more of a scientific sort of thing? Both. Um, Again, we've never looked at the probation violation data before, so we didn't realize. People felt like it took a long time, but no one ever knew how long. And and then, of course, that was a big issue. So I think the biggest thing that St. Louis County has done is brought everyone to the table. Um, Probation and parole has been an excellent partner in this effort and have um, placed probation and parole officers in the jail. So once you come to the jail on a probation violation, you are screened with an expert, that probation and parole officer, and that process is streamlined with the judges as well. You're talking about a lot of fiefdoms here, Mm -hmm. and we all know from our offices you can have these struggles between departments. Has Mm -hmm. there been any resistance in, in any level of government? I mean, I've been only involved in, you know, for four years, but people continually go to the come to the table. We have meetings weekly um, and there's been a lot of changes in staffing as well. And there have been concerns and discussions, uh, but for the most part, people continue to come to the table and understand how much of a of a challenge this is and how much we need to start this work. I think that the events in Ferguson were a wake up call for the county and people just realized that things have to change. And I think the MacArthur structure provides that avenue for people to discuss where they didn't before. People never asked everybody to go to the t- come to the table at one time. Now, call me a cynic, but it seems like <laughs> among the general public that the attitude is quite a bit different. It mm-hmm. seems like anytime someone talks about reducing the jail population, I see people in the comment section and they're talking about how this is a safety risk. We need to keep these people behind bars. Uh, have you faced backlash or has the effort faced any backlash from voters or, or from the community at large? Um, we have had a lot of support from the community, but nationally, these sort of efforts do, of course, have backlash. And that's why it's important for citizens to understand that these decisions aren't made um, randomly um, or in a capricious nature, that the judges have had a ton of training. Uh, we work with probation and parole, look at those risk scores. And we aren't just opening the door of the jail and, and throwing people out under the street, right? They're linked with services, linked with experts that can help them. But citizens also should understand is that, you know, putting someone in jail for 100 days and having them lose their job, that also is a risk, you know, for that family and the community at large. So we have to pay somehow, you know, if we can find um, places for people or link them in the community, then I think long term, we're going to have a better outcome. Mm -hmm. Now, earlier this year, a a nonprofit group posted bail for a man who was accused of domestic Mm -hmm. violence, and police now say he killed his accuser soon after being released Mm -hmm. from jail. Now, that was not a St. Louis County case. Right. (laughs) Just want to make that clear. It happened in St. Louis City Jail. But that had to have given people pause. Did you guys reconvene after that to to discuss, or was this Mm -hmm. something you were expecting might happen? Well, it's not something that anyone ever expects or wants to happen. I mean, that was a devastating case. Um, And we did meet meet weekly, so we met shortly after that. And St. Louis County has um, worked with the bail project um, as well. Uh, So we continue to refine or discuss some of our criteria. And so I know both the city and the county are are even looking closer at any cases that include domestic um, abuse. So I think that this is a continuing process. Um, So so absolutely that case is something that we are going to continue to look at. Got your attention. Mm -hmm. Now, the system here, like systems in every jurisdiction, it has been characterized by racial disparities. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about what you saw going in, and and has there been a change Mm -hmm. to that? Absolutely. Uh, When we... Uh, were asked to t- take on this task by MacArthur. It wasn't only to reduce the jail population, it was to reduce racial and ethnic disparities. And so that's been a big effort of ours. And that's one of the reasons that we looked at the, the people who have violated their probation. Those individuals were spending 12 or 13 days longer um, 
people of color than a, a very comparable white defendant. And so we saw a lot of differences there, and we have reduced those differences in terms of length of stay for probation, probation violations. We do continue to see racial disparities in the jail, as I'm sure jails do across the nation, but we are working um, on a couple of different processes to try to reduce that, which is, which is very difficult. Okay. We've just got time for probably one more okay. question here, but tell me, what is the next big push in this overall initiative? The next big push is, you know, one would be those continued racial and ethnic disparities. How can we serve all of the populations that come into the jail um, well? Uh, the second effort, and this goes along with racial disparities, because the biggest place we see racial disparities is in pretrial. So we're looking at the potential of a uh, risk instrument um, and continued training for judges to make sure that our pretrial population moves efficiently um, and that we serve the community and, and the citizens well. Well, thank you so much. Beth Hubner, Professor of Criminology and Criminal Justice at the University of Missouri-St. Louis. Thanks for being here today. Thank you. This is St. Louis on the Air on St. Louis Public Radio, 90.7 KWMU. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, saluting Earth Day on April 22nd with an ongoing commitment to help offset carbon emissions with sustainable harvesting of Missouri forests. Details at ChooseWood.com.